Hey everyone, the bread, baguette, finally a relevant approach to understanding human history. I came across a video called History of the Entire World According to Bread by the channel Food Theory and thought this was destiny. Actually, I have never uh, saw any of their video. It's going to be the first time I'm going to react to a video by this channel. So I'm very curious to do it. Let's go. This is a planet covered with people, different people, all kinds of people. For thousands of years, all these little people will join other little people to take over other little people. The little people that conquer the other little people will all use one thing and one thing only. Bread. Hello Internet! Welcome to Food Theory, the show that's laying down a trail of breadcrumbs that leads directly to world domination. Today's food theory has been on my bucket list, my bread basket list, for a while now. And no, it might not be the most searchable, no, it might not be the trending thing on TikTok, but it's always been trending in one place, my stomach. I'm talking about bread. This episode is an homage to the humble loaf from baguette to brioche, soda bread to cornbread, sourdough, chapata, challah to chapati, or just those unlimited breadsticks over at Olive Garden. I love them all. And while you might think that it's the pillowy texture I like, the science of baking, or some sort of weird dark lore about the Pillsbury Doughboy, oh no my friends, my feelings for bread go much deeper. I love bread because bread means one thing, power. There's For a Frenchman like me, it's one of the most beautiful introductions I've ever seen on a video. It's almost like watching adult movies. This guy has already won my heart. Nothing more powerful in this entire world than the mighty loaf. Who run the world? Bread. You look skeptical. I get it. All you carbophobes out there don't think that you could take over the world using just bread. If you doubt the power of this puffy hot dog holder, that only means one thing. And I'm gonna have to spend the next 18 minutes or so convincing you in the most unhinged way possible that bread is the most powerful substance on the planet. To show you this, I'm gonna have to tell you the entire history of the world in bread. By the time we're done, you'll not only have a new favorite food, but you'll know how to use it to conquer the world. World. Grab a slice for the road, everyone, because this one is going to be a trip. Now, if we're talking about bread conquering the world, we're going to need to get a little handle on the world itself. So for all of you who weren't finalists in the geography bee in high school, congratulations on doing literally anything else. We're just going to catch you up here. This is the world. And this right here, that's me showing you how to conquer the whole thing with carbs. Your next step will be to forget everything that you learned in 12 years of history class or whatever. The only thing that you really need to understand about history is bread. Bread, like all of us, starts from humble beginnings here in Mesopotamia, where it's 30,000 years ago and bread isn't bread yet. It's instead just some random seeds of grain. Here we are, little ancient people freshly emerging from the primordial ooze, wandering around killing things with sticks and trying to figure out which leaves we can eat. Someone has the weird idea to eat some wheat seeds grown in the wild. They smash them up a little, mix them with some water, and drop them into the fire until they're crispy. Voila! Bread. It's not much to look at. It is a weird, pulpy little cracker. But we love it. Because, let me tell you, it is better than eating bugs and leaves. The record of ruins from this time shows that bread is first found in ceremonial and sacred places, meaning that we thought it was pretty cool. A special awesome little cookie of carbs, and we love these ugly little wheat slabs so much that we're like, hey, what if we stopped wandering around and just waited for more of these wheat seeds to grow? And so... And from what I've read when I was preparing this episode, because uh, of course I'm not an expert in the bread topic and I was intrigued. It's very likely that bread was made before the advent of agriculture. Excavations in Turkey show that in this region, at least, bread appeared before agriculture and even before pottery. It was baked, topped with seeds of what they call St. Sophia grass. And it's also the earliest evidence of the use of condiments in human history. Well, that's exactly what we did. When you learn history, you think people just stopped being nomadic and then started to develop agriculture. But really, it was the other way around. We were like, hey, bit of bread addiction happening here. This is the best thing since sliced itself. So we're just going to sit here until more of it grows. And thus civilization was born because people wanted to eat more toast. From there, this is an absolute turning point in human history. It began in the Fertile Crescent, so you have the Mesopotamia, Syria, and the Nile Strait. Before agriculture and animal domestication, we have then the first villages and then the first cities. And this led 
to enormous changes in the way people were living. So, for example, you have the local production of the main resources, domestication of animals and plants, breeding, cultivation. Then you have innovations linked to this production, mastery of hydraulic techniques, irrigation, terracing, slope calculation, fluid management, river transport and canalization, and then the development of stable housing, often family-based. Then, with this agriculture, you are able to store the resources. So, you have then major settlements and domestication of major cereal, tubers, fruits, other plants, the emerging of techniques in order to preserve meat. Uh, you can dry it, salt it, smoke it, and plants to dry it, ferment it, salt it, then too. And then you start to master terracotta. And one last big change is then you have the notion of property rights, which extends to land ownership, whether it's individual or collective, private or public. And this will be accompanied by the development of law and economics. And of course, this will lead to the first conflicts. The popularity of bread, like any great celebrity, goes from fact to legend. For ancient Mesopotamian civilizations, wheat becomes deeply entwined with mythology. The Sumerians develop Nisaba, the goddess of grain and writing. She's a very big deal. Over time, bread hits the road, carried by the people who are still wandering nomads, all the way over to ancient Egypt, where there are some cool new kids in town calling themselves the pharaohs. Turns out the Egyptians have a little annual event that's pretty helpful for growing wheat. They all live next to this enormous river, the Nile, which was full of crocodiles and baby Moses's and was also very good at doing one thing every year, having a flood. The yearly flooding of the Nile, which is part of the natural water cycle of the region, ends up leaving behind a massive area full of well-watered crops with no hauling of water necessary. No digging fancy irrigation lines that no one's invented yet to grow these crops. At least until bread comes around. Turns out, people are gonna do a lot of things to get themselves more bread. So they invent elaborate irrigation channels, canals, dams that'll be used all over the world for thousands of years, all inspired by everyone's love of growing more bread. The Egyptians are also conducting wild scientific experiments to find more ways to eat bread. Kind of like the Alton Browns of the desert, experimenting with grinding up the wheat and actually mixing it with other stuff. Up to this point, most people were just kind of toasting up wheat seeds and packing them together with some water, then scalding the whole thing in a fire to make a flat, crackery little slab. But the Egyptians, they get wild with it. They make a paste out of ground up wheat and water, which they then leave out in the sun, inventing the entire process of yeast fermentation. Now, other civilizations have done fermentation before. I mean, we've invented beer at this point, we're not monsters, but this is like a whole new frontier for bread. Yes, it's a myth that Egyptians invented beer, so they were actually brewing some kind of beer and they had indeed Ninkasi, which was the goddess of beer. Ninkasi is also a very famous beer brand in Lyon, where I live. In fact, they were the first bars to introduce more elaborate beer. Uh, during the 98 World Cup, for example, you had IPA, Embered, smoked beers, and so on. And people told them back then that they were crazy and that this would never work. They were actually competing with regular lager beers. And now it's one of the biggest companies in the sector today and it's a real institution in the city. Like the latest TikTok craze, everyone wanted to get their hands on this bread that actually rises for exactly the same reasons that we follow trends today. The clout. The upper classes can now lord it over the little peons still eating flatbread made out of yucky barley instead of cool, puffy wheat. Bread is such an essential part of life that it becomes completely linked with the Egyptian gods, and all religious practices involve offerings of bread. The god Osiris, who is not only the Egyptian god of death and rebirth, but also agriculture, has illustrations showing wheat literally growing out of his body to symbolize resurrection. During festivals in ancient Egypt, priests bake something known as the divine bread, which is bread in the shape of Osiris, who himself was also bread. We're just gonna go with it. Isis, the sister of Osiris, is the goddess of wheat and barley, and by proxy beer, and is also known as the divine baker. She's supposedly responsible for teaching mankind how to make bread, really shafting the Sumerians who were doing it 20,000 years earlier. Everyone's plagiarizing these days. But not only is bread making mythology happen, it's making everything happen. I imagine that the yearly flu 
exploding of the Nile was also associated with kind of the cycle of life. So as this allowed to produce, I was going to say beer, but bread. So bread by definition was associated with uh, gods because I assumed that back then people were assuming that this yearly flooding of the Nile was a godly stuff. Actually, throughout history, ancient Egyptians would place provisions in their tombs to ensure the dead's subsistence in the afterlife. And you have also searches that found that a well-preserved funeral meal during the second dynasty of Egypt contained a triangular load of bread. Want to build a pyramid using slave labor? Gonna have to feed them. Bread's gonna come in handy for that. Want to raise an army? Just tell them to pack some bread and a spear. They're good to go. Want to trade with the nations around you? Here's something that might not have been seen before. It's bread. It turns out the Egyptians could grow bread well, and a lot of it, to feed a lot of people. Admittedly, not everyone needed the whole yeast rising process. The Israelites, for example, are like, you guys are mean. You keep your stupid bread bubbles. We got better things to do. And so they take their matzah and flee Egypt. But the rest of the world is like, put that bread in my face right now. Now, Egypt is incredibly powerful because they have the power of the bread and this will become and it's of course a global trend in human history if you control access to a raw material essential to your economy and to the uh, subsistence of your population, you become de facto a world power. On the pattern for every other nation who gets and grows a lot of wheat. Just watch, because next, bread does something amazing. It crosses the sea. Well, I mean, the sailors cross the sea. The bread actually lives rent-free on the boats, just like it does in my mind. And now bread is in Greece. As soon as it hits the shores of Greece, bread is the hot item, which you can see reflected again in a huge number of Greek myths and gods that all revolve around the power of bread. The main one is Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, agriculture, and specifically, grains. She gives big girl boss vibes. The Greeks are like, let's eat bread with every meal, which sounds like a dream, but it's gonna mean that they need a lot more bread. So much, in fact, that in 600 BC, they invent the first ever closed oven specifically for making bread. Before, people were just cooking everything over open fire pits, which were much less fuel efficient and left less control over the temperature. Using closed ovens, though, the Greeks could suddenly make oodles of bread with less fuel and more consistency, allowing them to feed even more people than the Egyptians could. Just like in the process, free up others for other productive tasks or go to war. And if we apply Maslow's theory, this leaves the way open for other occupations, such as imposing one's power on one's neighbor. And the Greek developed the bakery trade and they were producing over 70 varieties of bread using wine yeast stored in small and foray to make the dough rise. And I also saw that around the beginning of the 5th century before Christ, they invented the what they call the Olint Hopper Mill, which eased the workload of millers. The Egyptians and their irrigation systems, the oven is basically just there so the Greeks can get more bread. And you know what? It works. In 168 BC, they develop a baker's guild. And before you know it, the bread they make is on its way to Rome and Persia. As people push to the east to get access to the really crazy stuff, like salt, they spread bread to the areas that we now know as Western Asia. It's here that the new bread making techniques really take off. Wheat is a key part of the Persian Empire, especially when it comes to flatbread. They spread flatbread throughout the Middle East and Central Asia because it's durable, it's easy to transport, and it's a cinch to make even when you're traveling without any sort of special equipment. All you need is a really flat rock and a fire to heat it up. At this point, the only nations in the Mediterranean powerful enough to rival each other are the Greeks and the Persians. So of course, the two of them go to war. Ever heard of Aeneas? The Battle of Marathon? Xerxes, who invaded Greece in the year 300? All that happens, and sure, you can learn all the names of the heroes and the battles and all that stuff, but what it really comes down to is bread versus bread and who has more bread. And the answer is the Romans. Rome, in their classic move of stealing everything from the Greeks, quickly adopts a bread as the food source for their new empire and proceed it's more a strategy of assimilation than theft because if it was stealing it this would mean that the greeks would have no bread any longer no it's more like just as today we study market trends we draw inspiration from what our competitors are doing and come up with a better version or a product or service and Romans were the undisputed champion for this. 
seem to beat everyone with their awesome new inventions for making more bread. They injected lots of bread references into their own gods, like Ceres as the equivalent of Demeter. And while Rome certainly liked the smaller ovens that Greece had come up with, they're like, yeah, but what if we did it bigger? And so they made the first bakery-sized ovens to outfit commercial and government bakeries to supply bread to the masses. And with that, here comes bread's latest play for world domination, politics. See, the Romans don't win over two-thirds of Europe and that big chunk of Asia and like that massive top section of Africa for nothing, they also don't do it by keeping a massive standing army or holding everyone under martial law. That would be impossible. No, the way they do it is with bread. The Roman Empire knows that everyone's really into the stuff, so to keep populations loyal to them, they set up government-sponsored welfare in the form of Chiora Anonai, or a grain dole that provides grain or bread to hundreds of thousands of Roman citizens. You ever hear about all those great roads that Rome built back in the day? They did it to transport bread, or at least the wheat to make the bread, which they imported from Egypt, Sicily, and other places across the empire, and then distributed to all the poor of Rome. Guess who's not gonna rebel against you? People getting shipments of food from you. Remember, bread is the most efficient, portable, and tasty form of nutrition the world has ever seen. All the cool kids have it, which means that everyone else wants to be a part of the in crowd and get in on those hot bread trade routes. The populations who receive bread from the empire grow from about 40,000 to about 200,000. This is what we saw in the episodes on the Carthaginian Wars. Rome is also a demographic superpower, which enabled them to outstrip their rivals. And I've read an anecdote. At some point, the Gauls were besieging Rome, and in order to make them believe that they couldn't reduce it by starvation, the Romans threw bread at them in order to discourage them. And guess what? They stay loyal. Rome's play to win over the world with bread is best known by the phrase panem et circenses, bread and circuses, a phrase still used to this very day because there are two things in the world that you need to keep the lowly masses placated. You give them bread and you keep them entertained. Why? Because bread wins, and when the bread runs out, so does your empire. Back in old Rome, the systems for doling out bread to the masses become incredibly popular, as you would expect. But in the later years of the Roman Empire, their strategy starts to backfire because people simply stop working and instead wait for the emperor to just give them their bread. There's a massive decline in productivity, Roman innovation, and of course, no one wants to join the army when you could just sit at home and get free stuff all the time. So Rome's footprint begins to shrink when the bread bureaucracy gets bigger than its army. When the edges of the empire start shrinking because, like, no one's standing out there to defend it, the bread imports stop flowing, the bread doles stop doling, and the Roman empire comes to a standstill to make way for newer, breadier competitors. And till the very last years of his existence, Rome remained very dependent on wheat imports from Egypt, for example, to feed its population. And for it, the bread population process is well mastered. But Italy has very few cultivable areas overall. You have the region of the Po, but that's about it. And a friend of mine who specializes in ancient Rome also told me that the latest big innovation is the re-reading of the climate and that every political crisis can be linked to climatic episodes that affect harvest. From here through about the 1400s, things split a little between East and West, depending on which flavor of Christianity you pick. There were only two flavors, which puts you either landing in the Byzantine Empire or the Holy Roman Empire, both of which are ruled by powerful people, and by people, I mean powerful bread. For the Byzantine Empire, which is headquartered in Istanbul, way back when it was Constantinople, not Istanbul, thanks we might be giants, bread is the most important thing they have. Yeah, sure, they have olives and spices and whatever else from the Greeks, but to feed one million people now living in Constantinople, they needed one thing more than any Anything else, they need bread. The Guild of Bakers in Constantinople are considered to be a protected group at this time, and no one can interfere with the making of bread in any way because everyone knows that once the bread stops getting made, the city shuts down. The wealthy eat the great fluffy bread, the peasants continue to eat hard yucky bread, and the monks are usually on a fast, so that kind of takes care of itself. Meanwhile, over at the Holy Roman Empire, bread has already been spread to places like Gaul, where people have adopted it immediately because before they were eating porridge. Christianity is the name of the game here, but like the Romans, Greeks, and Egyptians before, Forum, bread still figures heavily into religion, which figures heavily into governing everyone. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus multiplying loaves of bread and Jesus breaking bread with his disciples are all stories and ideas that figure heavily at this time. Okay, I'm feeling a bit silly, but I think I've just understood something very important because why the bread indeed? So I, I'm not a very religious person, but... 
Of course, every religion has a social base. And in fact, uh, religion, the word comes from the Latin word religere, which means connection or bonding people together. So we necessarily start with a symbol of life, like bread, of course. Faithfulness to God is tied to the idea of getting enough bread, especially since everyone from all corners of Europe are eating about two pounds of bread every day, including using it as plates, which they call trenches. Bread is so central to both the Holy Romans and the Byzantines that governments start stepping in to control it using methods like price fixing. They set the price of bread low enough to be affordable, which was another bread invention that continues to this very day. But as soon as you lose the bread, you start losing the power. After a couple centuries of bad plagues throughout Byzantium, the vulnerable empires left open and some neighbors start conquering the lands that produce the grain. And you know the story by this point, it's the beginning of the end. Slowly the Byzantines become disorganized and fall to the Turks, who, surprise surprise, control the grain making areas of Eastern Europe and the Middle East. So you get it, right? We've been through what, five empires now? I think you're starting to get the picture that bread is responsible for the history of the world. But you know what? I can hear your skeptical comments. Yeah, Matt Pat, but that was then. The world has gone gluten free at this point. We don't fight with pole arms anymore. Modern people stopped caring about bread long ago go right wrong throughout the centuries of Gaul which became what we now know as France the biggest uprisings and rebellions all centered around a shortage of bread the Grand Rebain in Lyon in 1529 poor grain harvests lead to the working peasants having no bread so thousands of them break into the city's granaries to take back the grain from the government 1590 there's a siege in Paris where normally Parisians are eating one and a half to two and a half pounds of bread a day they become so desperate for bread during the months-long siege they grind human bones to make bread flour which ultimately leads to the king surrendering and France changing religions. Fast forward to the 1760s where totally unregulated grain production leads to extremely high prices on bread and people start to starve. In 1775, people start rioting for bread. This isn't called the French Revolution at the time, it's called the Flower War because people are seriously hangry without their baguettes. 1789, you think the storming of the Bastille was all about getting weapons? It was about... Let them eat cake. Actually, Marie Antoinette never said that, but yes, revolution is an uprising of the people and they don't give a damn about the ideas of the Enlightenment and so on. No, that's for the bourgeois, the intellectual, the writers, the notables, no, the commoners just want to eat. They are starving. So yes, indeed, this is about bread getting bread. Sure, the mobs had their torches and their pitchforks, but you know what they were looking for? The royal store of grain. They were literally starving. Marie Antoinette is painted as a villain when she hears about the flour shortages and famously says, qu'il mange de la brioche, which doesn't mean let them eat cake. It actually means let them eat brioche, which is a luxury form of enriched bread, because bread is still considered to be the be-all end-all of eating. She probably I'm starting to be seriously hungry. He didn't even actually say this, but the power of a statement about bread is the single most famous and inflammatory quote to come out of the entirety of the French Revolution. But maybe it's just France, right? They're a bit nutty for their bread. <laughs> no, not by a long shot. Time to check in on another famous empire, the British. Sorry, Tom, she's included here as well. The British Empire, famous- Oh, the British Empire. Okay, I'm sorry about this joke, but I've been injected a very little dose of Officer Crabtree from the series Allo Allo a couple days ago, and I think that my brain has not uh, reset yet for taxing early American colonists on tea are actually plagued with another big problem in the years leading up to the American Revolution, bread shortages. While not as famous as the Boston Tea Party, in 1775, thousands of poor American colonists protest from Philadelphia to Salem about the shortages of grain and the incredibly high bread prices, most of which are controlled by the British government. In an article by Barbara Clark Smith, she writes, quote, thousands were reported clamoring for bread and crowds escorted a merchant, a butcher, and a speculator accused of raising prices to the city jail. As it happened in Boston, Boston two years earlier, crowds assumed the power to identify and punish enemies to the patriot cause. Once again, the enemy of the bread is the enemy of the people. And wouldn't you know it, one little revolution later and things really start taking off for that new country of America. And why is that? Because wheat is produced in almost every state in the entire country. Heck, we have a specific region called the Wheat Belt. We're always singing about our amber waves of grain. I think it's an accident that the US became a global superpower over the last few hundred years. It shouldn't be when you look at how much bread we have. Today we export almost 
harvest 50 million tons of wheat every year. Let's just say that policies around producing wheat can get pretty heated, so I'm not going to be going into all that. But to give you an indication, the U.S. government has paid out over $48 billion in wheat subsidies since 1995, all to support wheat production in this country because, once again, say it with me, bread is power. Whew, and with that, we are at the present day. Whew, that took a lot out of me. I hope I've convinced you now that the entire history of the world comes down to bread, and all you have to do is follow who has the bread at any given time. But if you've been watching this channel for a while, you should probably be asking yourself one thing. Why bread? Like, why? Why not any other food item in the entire world? Sure, bread's delicious, but so are baked potatoes, and you could grow those pretty easily. So are beans, and eh, no, beans suck. But you can't grow them, so why not something like the legume civilization? That's a question that was on the mind of one particular cultural anthropologist, Dr. James C. Scott of Yale University, who went and wrote an entire book observing that if you wanted to build an early civilization, you needed to have a grain-based economy, because grain was the only way to have an economy in the first place. If you notice something throughout this episode, it's that people used bread to get what they wanted. Sure, they ate the bread, but they also traded bread to get everything else they needed. You see, at the end of the day, bread isn't just the food source of all these civilizations, it's also the currency. Sure, they may have had gold coins or fancy little francs or whatever, but that's all bogus if everyone is starving. Bread is power because bread is literally money that you can eat. And the rulers of all these empires, they know that. Remember, most of these empires relied on giving free bread to people. Grain was the basis of taxation in all these empires because in order to give food to people who don't have it, you need to take it away from the people who do. And why are you taking... And taxation is the affirmation of a central power that can legislate. And in France, yes, that actually, if we follow the legislation on bread, meals, and who has the right to produce bread, and on taxes, well, overall, we are following kind of the assertion of the royal power from the 14th century to Louis XVI. In grain? Well, grain like wheat is special for three big reasons. First, it's transportable. You need it if you're going to have a big empire with a huge transportation network for food. And what makes something easy to transport? Number two, being light and dry. So it's not going to rot and you won't be carrying around a whole bunch of water weight. Immediately, you could start to see from these criteria that crops like potatoes, lotus roots, most other root starches, they're all out. Potatoes are 70 to 80% water by weight. And water, it's heavy. They didn't have dehydrated instant flakes back in the day, which also meant that they weren't able to eat easily divide up something like a potato. Wheats and grains, they're very divisible. You can weigh them out down to the tenth of an ounce, so you know exactly how much you're getting, or how much you're giving away when you're portioning out doles to the peasants. It also grows number three above ground, which doesn't seem like it should be that big of a deal, but it's everything to these empires. Remember, the entire idea of a central government only exists if that government's able to collect taxes from the citizens. Again, these taxes aren't money, they're crops. When someone's growing wheat, they can't hide it. You can literally see the wheat grow in months before harvest season, so a tax assessor can roll on by and estimate a farmer's yield for the year. Then you come by at the same precise time every year and you take your cut right as everything's getting harvested. Potatoes, root veggies, some beans, they're not visible. They're grown underground or very close to the soil. And that means that farmers can more easily hide them from the government. They can tell the tax collector, oh yeah, we had ourselves a terrible harvest this year. Barely any potatoes, but here's your 10%, I guess. And the tax collector would have no way to know if they were lying. They're a great crop if you're a tax evader, which means that they're terrible if you're a government that's trying to collect taxes. A terrible example example of governments only being interested in wheat happened during the Irish potato famine of the 1840s. During this time, it's well known that the Irish were super reliant on potatoes as one of their only food sources. And there are lots of reasons for that, but any idea why they didn't have any wheat around during this period? Well, they did, but a large portion of it was being exported to the British for compulsory payments to the government, who owned Ireland at the time. So, because wheat was easy to transport, the British were more than happy to take it all, while the hundreds of thousands of Irish people died because of the failure of their less taxable potato crop. So, so this is an horrible episode and it's by the way an overcase of follow the money and you get the story. I'm not an expert but the crisis of the potato lasted several years I guess and was managed very poorly by London. One consequence was the mass exodus of Irish people to the US. And of course, you have the rise of the Irish national sentiment and resentment against the British who were perceived as colonialists. And all of this is happening actually during the Industrial Revolution where the English economy is going to skyrocket because of 
they are very specific management of agriculture with the system of the enclosures i guess which make um, where you have these very big landlords which rationalizes the production of wheat amongst other things i guess uh, and this frees up a lot of people to go in the cities and give a lot of manpower for emerging industries so there it is we're done wheat runs the whole world what i didn't talk about the whole world i forgot about all those other continents like south america the entire eastern part of asia most of the continent of africa all of australia yeah you're right i didn't i didn't actually forget about them but i did focus on the areas of history that this audience is probably most familiar with but that's not nearly the end of the story so here's how the mighty bread plays out in the rest of the world the secret friends is this having wheat in your country isn't about being smarter than other countries around you it's not about having better weapons or more technology or whatever it's all luck the reason central and southern africa didn't figure heavily into the bread war over the last few thousand years is that these areas weren't well suited for growing grains. Wheat, as it turns out, is a little bit picky about where it grows, and it needs temperate climates and loamy soil. That's great if you're in the Fertile Crescent, but crummy if you're in the Ivory Coast. If you look at the world map of where grains grow on this planet, you'll notice a few conspicuous absences, notably in a huge part of South and Central America, as well as a huge portion of the African continent, Northeastern Asia, and in Central Australia, primarily because most of these places, they're too hot. We can see that these areas won't be able to come into power using bread alone like us cheaters in Europe, North America, and Central Asia, their stories play out much like our own, only using a different cereal crop, corn. Corn, or maize, if you're not speaking American English, was a staple crop of Mesoamerican civilizations over yonder in Central and South America. As we've said repeatedly throughout this episode, the history of civilization is really the history of grains, again offering those three advantages that you associate with the grain. It's easily transportable, it's easily measurable, and it's clearly visible to keep farmers from evading their taxes. And much like the Greeks and Romans infused wheat into their mythology, Mesoamerican mythology swaps all of that out with corn. The Aztecs had Santiago, the maize god, who we see surrounded by corn, while the Mayans take the idea of grain, and specifically maize, and turn it into the building block of human civilization. Literally. Where the Mayan creation myth begins with humanity literally being sculpted from dry corn. And, just like other civilizations, they had other options to choose from, like potatoes. But freeze-drying these to make them transportable took an incredibly long time. Whereas corn, it could be dried right on the stalk. After the decline of the Mayans and Aztecs, largely because it changes to the climate that kept them from producing enough corn, you see the Incas further south in Peru spreading their influence, knowledge, and culture through, say it with me now, bread. Only this time it was bread made from corn. The Incas were master agricultural engineers. And, and actually I saw this on a trip uh, just before the pandemic and it's incredible to see. I mean the earth moving work is outstanding because here we are talking about cultivation at very very great height something like several thousand meters high and on top of that you have a very elaborate system of roads to connect the various centers of the inca empire honestly it's very truly impressive rather than just outright conquering neighboring people groups, they just showed up and said, hey, how will we help you grow better corn? And everyone's like, yeah, I'll take that. And the Incan Empire thrives until the Europeans show up and ruin everything like they tend to, bringing it all back together into one unified timeline. On the other end of the world, stay with me here, this is gonna get tricky, the, the same, same thing, thing happens same. again. Zooming in on the other side of the ocean and looking at that grain map again, you get a big old pocket in this middle area of China that's a good place to grow grain, which is why grain appears right there on the national emblem of China. Except this time we're not talking about wheat or corn, we're talking rice. While well, the ancient Egyptians were becoming an early major civilization through the power of wheat, Asia had a growing empire of its own in what we now know as modern day China. And just like civilizations took off in ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt because the conditions were just right for growing grains, we can see a similar pattern throughout Asian history. If you wanted to support a government that could collect taxes and efficiently distribute food as a resource, you needed to have conditions that were right for grains. Enter the balmy, humid Yangtze River Valley, perfect for rice cultivation and the cradle of Chinese civilization in much the same way that the Fertile Crescent was for Mesopotamia. You may have heard about the Three Kingdoms period in ancient Chinese history where three rival states existed, the Shu, the Wu, and the Wei. It probably comes as no surprise that for each of these three kingdoms, you can trace the source of their power to some ideal condition that allowed them to cultivate rice. Shu had the Sichuan Basin, Wei had the Yellow River Valley, and Wu had the Lower Yangtze River. In the same way that grain was a source of government power in the Western world, rice and the conditions for growing it represented power in the Eastern world. I'm not sure, 
rice isn't always made into bread, it is made into buns and noodles and all kinds of bread adjacent products. It also functions in the same way as bread and most importantly of all, drives the same power dynamic that fuels everything in history. So there you have it friends, the history of the world is all just bread. In the future, is it possible that the history of the world will still rely on something as simple as bread even in the face of all the weapons and technology and AI and Amazon? Yeah, I think it will. Follow the bread and you'll always see who's in the power seat. Now if you'll excuse me, after making it through the last few tens of thousands of years of history, I'm on a little slice of toast. And as always, my friends, remember, it's just a theory. A food theory! Bon appetit! <laughs> And hey, if you're interested in more food history, check out how coffee single-handedly caused human enlightenment. No joke, the science that we have available to us today is solely thanks to the humble coffee bean. That video is on screen right now, so make sure you click it. And as always, my friends, I'll see you next week. Okay, that was very interesting. And we can add a very contemporary example, so Ukraine. I'm not going to discuss about the current war, but Ukraine is a place of constant tragedy, at least for the first half of the 20th century. And parts of their tragedy stems from their immense wheat fields, which make them the breadbasket of Europe. When the Nazis took power and imposed their will, there was the dream of creating a colonial empire in the East, the Lebensraum. It's also a result of the trauma of the Allied blockade during World War I that creating mass famine in Germany. So Ukraine and its rich agriculture is a mean of subsistence for them. So it was a prime target. And also for an other episode, uh, if you have the stomach for it, um, sorry, no pun intended, but if you have the guts for it, uh, just try to Google Holodomor and good luck. Anyway, that was very, very interesting. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and have a nice day. Bye.